Time hasn't arrived. We're going to uh, call this uh, Council at Large meeting to order. If everybody can please stand and we're going to salute the American flag. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you very much. Um, first of all, thank you everybody for being here tonight. As you know, uh, Shana, Wynn, Moses, and myself came up with this, uh, this notion um, to meet quarterly. Uh, and this is actually the fourth and final for this legislative session. And uh, I'd like to take this opportunity to thank Council Barnes. Of course, Shana didn't seek re-election. Re She's been an advocate and a true public servant for the citizens of the city of Rockford. So we're going to give her a round of applause. <laughs> So again, really the forum tonight, and I want to thank Council Fowler, we, we do have an agenda and they're floating around if anybody wants to see one, but um, we learned after the first one that this is really, the whole basis of these meetings are to hear from the people that we serve, constituents and taxpayers. Um, Council Fowler has some invited guests tonight, which is great, um, but just for some housekeeping, um, it is being taped, uh, it will be aired on, on uh, cable access. If you have a question, you know, we're going to give you the microphone so you can be duly noted. Um, but also, if you can uh, please just know uh, going forward, um, not about this specific meeting, um, but going forward for City Hall meetings, the elevator to City Hall is broken. It's going to be broken for six to eight months. Months. So um, uh, we're going to have a FinCom um, next Monday, and then we're going to have Christmas is the 25th. On the 26th, it will be a City Council meeting. Uh, as the president, I've, uh, I've been able to say that we're going to have it in the Brockton High School Long Little Theater, George Long Little Theater in Brockton High. The next president coming in uh, after the inaugural on January 1 can decide, you know, where he and she wants it. I suspect it's probably going to continue to be in the little theater, um, perhaps here, perhaps in cable studio. But just, just uh, please bear in mind, it's, it's really going to be a, a long process to the point where the inaugural, which historically has always been at City Hall in Brockton, uh, will not be this year. Um, two things. Number one, it's mandated to be the first Monday, so on January 1st, New Year's Day, uh, at 10 o'clock, we will be sworn in, uh, and it's going to be at the War Memorial on West Elm Street at 10 o'clock. So if you're around on New Year's Day and you want to come and visit, and uh, please, we, we, have, we welcome you. I think that the attendance might be a little slim that day. Uh, with that being said, um, I'm just going to uh, send the microphone down, and uh, I'm going to open it up for the council follow up. Thank you. And I'm just very quickly going to introduce the guests that we have tonight. We have Robert Malley, who is Executive Director of the Parking Authority. And to his left, my right, is Phil Griffin. Phil is Chairman of the Board of Directors for the Brockman Redevelopment Authority. I think everyone knows Councilor Moses Rodriguez and Council President Sullivan, and we have Shannon. So, with that said, I, I wanted to have uh, Bob and Phil come in to talk a little bit about the downtown parking garage project. As you know, we were very fortunate to receive $10 million of grant money from the state for the garage. And there, obviously, we haven't broken ground yet. There is planning. There are a number of different issues that have to be resolved. But the progress is being made. And with that, I think I will turn it over to our two gentlemen down there in whatever order they wish to speak to uh, provide us with an update. Thank you, Council. Thank you very much for the invitation tonight also. Uh, good evening, everybody. I'm Phil Griffin. I'm the chairman of the Broccoli Development Authority. Uh, what's going on with the garage right at this moment, uh, we're in the process of negotiating with Trinity <laughs> to have the property being taken over by the DRA. Still in the state of negotiation. That we put forward Eventually, we'll have to go in front of the city council to get the project approved. Uh, that cannot happen to January because of the changes in the council during the last election cycle. Uh, Bob Mallory, the executive director, was nice enough to come here tonight. Bob has been attending all the meetings, and he is the man that's going to do the yeoman's work tonight as far as all the details go. Uh, so, with that, I'm going to hand it over to Bob and let him uh, give you a little more information on the intricacies of the project so far. Thanks, Bill. Thank you. 
Fourth Street to the garage, right? And um, we turn the two-way traffic on Heck Melly. Um, and that'll be the last step. Uh, uh, we met with the Trinity this month, just uh, two days ago in Boston, um, to work out the, the design plans. They had started designing the garage, and the design plans were at 65 percent complete. Right? So we're negotiating the purchase. It's actually the DRA that is negotiating the purchase uh, of the plans as they are and uh, trying to get the contract that uh, the developer's icon, right? And they're uh, we're trying to get their plans for the same price that Trinity was going to pay for them, right, to complete the plans. At that point, uh, the construction will block the bid under uh, Section 149. Um, yeah, we have the, the uh, purchase and sale agreement being put together, we're working on that now. Uh, it's going to have to include any easements uh, that Trinity will need in order to make both properties, the, the vacant area that's now a parking lot and the front building that was phase one, plus the housing that's already there, uh, viable for once, uh, once the garage goes up. Any access roads on both sides, etc. cetera. Um, any uh, parking spaces, leases of parking spaces, will have to be negotiated with the parking authority. They're not going to be part of this deal. Uh, we will agree that we will make them a lease for what they need, but we'll negotiate lease terms with them. Uh, in January, uh, we expect to have uh, two items before the council. Uh, one is the acceptance of the grant, which hasn't uh, gone through yet. Uh, and the second is transferring of the funding to the DRA. Uh, we expect that to have to do that in January. Uh, we've hired Pink Management uh, as our OPM. Uh, they are the ones who are working through this transition with um, with Trinity, right? They're the ones who went through all the plans to make sure that it actually is at 65 percent, uh, as they had indicated to us, and they have agreed that the plans are at 65 percent done. Um, and with that, I will uh, take any questions that anybody. Anybody has? Actually, expand a little bit on why we need the downtown parking garage, because you had a study done, uh, a very comprehensive study, which yielded a lot of information that the average person wouldn't know, and I found quite interesting. Yeah, there's a, there's a, a huge parking shortage on the north end of the downtown. Right. Not the south end so much, but the north end. Um, there are many developable properties right around the location of the new garage, uh, including the base school of Trinity, including 93 Center Street, uh, including the old Petronelli building, including 19 Main Street, um, the expansion of uh, the Naval Health Center, uh, W.B. Mason's plans to uh, expand, right? And so none of these things are going to, uh, we don't have the capacity to park the people who are going to need to park there without this garage. And our practice study indicated that this should be picked up uh, in the uh, timeline, right, to uh, as soon as possible, right, um, it, you know, it, it's all part of a bigger plan, uh, the parking study is online if anybody wants to read it, um, it's all part of a bigger plan which will, you know, include redeveloping the whole downtown area, right, uh, and parking is going to be necessary to get that done. Uh, about the two way, you said returning Petronelli uh, way to two way. I was actually at, talking to a resident of um, Tipsy Center Monday, and we were. I was asking him if, if he knew if that were the, the plan to uh, return that to the two way. So my question is: Is it going to go all the way two way from Maine to Montello, or just from Montello to the new street two way? No, it's all the way, all the way from Maine to Montello okay. two way. So now, how does that affect um, the one way traffic?
department has looked into that, right? And this is the first step for supposedly for uh, one-way well, Main Street and two-way traffic on Main Street, right? A lot of these things have to be turned around in order to get that. It's, just, it's the first step. But no, we don't anticipate any bottlenecks or anything being caused by this. Because you're going to have the, the road coming in from Court Street too, right? From Court Street to the garage. So most of the traffic entering will go over Court Street. Oh, through the parking lot? Through both parking lots. Oh, I see. Okay. 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 Thank you. Oh. Sorry. No, go ahead. Well, uh, two quick questions. Um, how many levels <laughs> on the garage? And I, I know you said you couldn't give an um, exact number on parking spaces, but can you give an estimate? Well, the garage itself is 414 spaces. Okay. Right, on four levels. Okay. Right, nothing on the ground. Thank you. Hi, Bob. Um, my question is, um, there was a lot of discussion about this. Um, I know um, at, at the beginning when we were talking about this. So what has changed from the original, um, you know, both in Trinity is no longer the developer of the garage. When did that happen? Uh, I can't give you an exact date. Okay. A couple months ago. Okay, so within a couple months ago. Yeah, and uh, so any phase two project would be entirely separate from this. Uh, there, yeah, once we've um, got the purchase of sale agreement from Trinity, right, um, and and the you know the, all the agreements, easements that they need to make. Both properties viable. They'll have nothing to do with this garage except to negotiate a lease for spaces from us for their phase two and for their tenants in phase one. And so the city is going to own the garage, and we would collect all of the uh, the uh, money that comes from that garage. And Trinity won't be given a chance at it. Yeah, that's absolutely right. Yeah, we're getting the garage for its all. Currently, uh, Trinity leases 60 spaces for us, from us, uh, in the parking lot that's behind there, which we lease uh, back from them for a dollar for 99 years or until the garage is built. They pay market rate right, for 60 spaces, and it's for the, uh, for the people who work in the building uh, that used to be the Enterprise on Main Street. So. They will need those, <clears throat> plus when they fill out the rest of that building, they're gonna need another 40 anyway, right? And then if they build on the, uh, the phase two, when they build phase two, they're going to need 26 more spaces that are above ground there, right? That will be no longer be usable, right? Once phase two is built. So they're gonna have to fill in the garage. And then when they build the housing, they're also gonna need, the, the garage that's planned for underneath that is not big enough for one to one, uh, so they're going to need some more spaces for that. So um, they have asked for a total uh, lease of 159 spaces. Right. Okay, so all right, so you know when the new courthouse was built, um, the they were like all the district, uh, the district court and everything that they were everywhere and all over the place. So when they built that and they built the the lot behind it. It started out with a, de a deficiency to even be able to park the cars, the people that worked at the courthouse, that worked at the courthouse at the time. And um, it, it actually ended up being a little, a little bit chaotic. So now if Trinity is anticipating using, you know, a fourth or so of the spaces um, that, that are gonna be available, is it gonna be a deficiency for the people that work at the, the unemployment there and welfare and, and, and all those other places? I'll tell you why, and it's, it, this is addressed in the parking study also, right? Um, we have peak hours at 10 o'clock in the morning, right? But 
10 o'clock to, or say, 9 o'clock to 11 o'clock, 11.30 is when we have a crunch on parking. Right? The people who are going to be residents there, right, that's not when they're going to park there. They're going to be parked in the off hours. Right. Where so, they park their car and take the train, pop the train and go to Boston, their car will be there. Well, people who take the train, most of them don't use the car. So we found that out with, uh, with the station office project when they were forced uh, by zoning uh, to add, to have 17 other spaces outside their, their uh, footprint. <laughs> they didn't use any of them. We had to let them out of the, out of the lease, but they didn't use them. You know, there's a lot of this uh, transit-oriented development parking, right? People don't even have cars, right? Mm -hmm. But if, if they do, we're not anticipating the problem. Okay. Right. And in fact, we want the 160 to help fill it right away. What about the uh, parking rates for the new parking garage? Have you guys discussed that at all? No. <coughs> the rates are set uh, in January of the year. Um, I anticipate that we'll start at the same rate that we, start, we have at the other garage. Uh, um, my board is meeting in January to discuss rates for the upcoming year, but we've only had one price increase since I've been there. In fact, there's been one increase since 1999, it was in 2012. I held the line on, par on parking rates um, basically since 1999. Parking is cheap in that number. Is the uh, Main Street garage normally filled to capacity? The garage is filled uh, totally full two, three times a year. Really? Right. But it's 80 to 90% capacity almost every Wednesday, Thursday. Those are busy days. Housing court on Wednesday. Right. I don't know what the reason is on Thursday, but Wednesday, Thursday are the busiest days. And it's 80 to 90% full almost every, every week. What about new garage in terms of um, Jobs, uh, employment. Well, obviously, you're going to have to have people. I'm saying, how many people do you think that that is going to require? I figure it's going to need 24-hour security at, any, at the least. Right. Uh, we are not planning on having it gated uh, with a boot. Right. This is going to be high tech. Right. The technology that will go in there will be like you see in most modern garages, where you know people. Pay a machine, pay by space, right. by credit card or by uh, or with cash. Um, it, but obviously, we need maintenance. When you say when you say pay, do you say pay at the gate or pay at, at a station? At a station. Okay. At a station, not at the gate. There won't be attendance <coughs> at a gate. That's uh, old school. Right. Um, it will be. Uh, you'll you'll need maintenance people, right, and you'll need security. Say security, you're, you're talking about hiring some security, not necessarily police and that kind of stuff. Uh, that hasn't been determined yet. When we have a garage, I'll try and figure, I'll try and figure out what I need to run it. Talk about it. And see. Yeah. I, I have a question, Bob. Okay. It may not, it may not be something you want to address tonight anyway. It has nothing to do with the parking garage. And, and we talked about this years ago. We were not informed. And um, that has to do with parking meters, like parking time on Main Street and South. We have one hour parking. That cre you know that creates a problem for certain businesses. Uh, the tuxedos they're in are okay. My place they like to hang around. They don't spend their money, but they like to hang around. Um, now it goes by very quickly. Um, and we talked about the meters with the debit card, credit card, and cash option. And I know you were fully borrowed because you told me that it's and I'm not putting words in your mouth correctly. Right. Yeah. It ha that was a long time ago. Um, the parking authority, whoever they are, the folks on this, has it ever came up to possibly yeah, I'm, put I'm those glad you asked that. I'm glad you asked that. I'm glad you asked that question. Yeah. Yes, that's all still in the works. Uh, the parking study uh, that we had, and as has been done in cities all over the country, right? You can't give away free parking. Right. Right. All the parking should be paid. Right, um, and you're correct, it needs to be high tech and it needs to be unlimited hours. Now we've talked to the, we had a presentation actually with the parking study uh, to the traffic commission. Um, and yes, we have, we've actually ordered meters to replace the ones that are there now so that we can test them. Right, 
but in the future we do plan Main Street, Legion Parkway, et cetera. Um, unlimited parking, unlimited hours, right, as long as the people are willing to pay for it. Sure. Right. They right. generally, from what I know, <coughs> now I'm a courier by trade, I do know a little bit about transportation and parking. Courier deliveries, I've been dead a long time. <laughs> and generally they gave you the first 10 minutes or 15 minutes for free, so that if you didn't, if you went to John Mary and you got your taxi, you came out, you were out the door, mm -hmm. and you didn't have to pay. After that, it was only like 50 cents every 15 minutes, or 15 minutes. So if you wanted to park all day, it would cost you about $8, I guess, mm -hmm. not the math. Um, and that's fine. But if you wanted to stay two hours, you know, $2. Yeah, $2. yeah and that's how we yeah. plan to. The, the object is, is um, well, su supply and demand parking, right. anyway. Um, but the beauty of the new meters is that you can program them for whatever, you know, they can all be programmed differently. The highest, uh, Demand areas can be programmed at a, at a higher rate. The lowest demand programs can be free or or, or whatever. But the meters have actually been delivered. The the, um, the guts of the meters, the, the actual mechanism, That's good news. right, is already there. They're stacked up in our office. We're waiting for the housings, right, because they need new housings too. The housings are back ordered. I put a call in to get those weeks. Happy about that. Yeah. Check that one out. <laughs> And then once they go in, they'll be in the in the areas where we already have them for now, yeah. right? Until we get cleared through. It's a standard. Um, it's a standard. Right. It's a big problem. And we want to test them and make sure that everything works the way we want it to work before we go spreading it. And then of course that will be put out, you know, uh, in an RFP. Right? We could buy them off a state bid list, but I'd like to get prices because um, I think sometimes you can find a better price than what's on the state. Bid. Bob, in terms of the, the parking garage, just let me state of the art, and, and I looked at some of the ones recently in the city of Boston, and there's a potential revenue source that the city of Boston utilizes relative to um, giving amenities to people that, that park their cars there, such as if you have an electric car, you can charge it while you're away, you actually have to pay a little bit of a premium. Uh, there's another a one on State Street where you park your car and can actually uh, give you kind of detail for a price. And the city of Boston benefits. Is, it, is there any thought to block this since this is going to be state of the art, like doing some things outside of the box? Yeah, well, certainly. Yeah. yeah. We have park charging stations in the garage on uh, right now. Yeah. Well, they're taking all the space. Uh, yeah. Spaces are taken up by city electric cars. Right. right. No, they, yeah, you could compare and contrast Boston, but I mean, I think it's, I mean, you're not going to make a million bucks on it, but there's a potential benefit. Yeah, we looked at that about five years ago and the percentage of electric cars was so low yeah. as to make it unprofitable. Right. But you may be right so now. Since it's increasing, that, yeah. That, that, since it's increasing, yeah. Okay. That, uh, yeah, it, and if there's a need for it, we'll certainly put, we have no problem with the charging stations. Good, awesome. Good. City Councilor, and that's where this parking garage is going. This is what really important for people to understand. First of all, long before this study, we knew we needed parking. The study was done by professionals that do this throughout the country and Canada. So this was very thorough. It's, it's available for people to understand and, and, and be aware of. Two, that this is really great for the City of Broughton on several notes. First of all, because we were given the grant for $10 million, so it's not like your taxes where you live are going to go up to pay for this garage. 
this department, the Parking Authority, is one of the departments that actually brings money to the city. Very important. And most of the people that bring the money come from elsewhere. Because over 3,000 people work downtown, and that's disregarding anyone that does business downtown. So whether, uh, let's say, Trinity Financials, we keep on referring to those for you that don't understand, it's the Enterprise Block on one side and Enzo Flats at the Montello and Center Street intersection. Even if they were not to expand, the majority of the spaces in that parking garage are already, how would I say, requested by individuals doing business or working. With the expansion of W.B. Mason that's getting you know, national recognition and now what the largest office supply company in the, you know, in the nation, that's a pretty big deal. And they're right downtown across the street and they're growing. So this is really a win-win situation. It's really positive. And what's great about this is with Parking Authority overseeing this and the Broughton Redevelopment Authority, that means you get to see whatever money they spend and it's a really good chance for people in, you know, in the Brockton, you know, city of Brockton with these skills and opportunities for jobs as they come along. And this construction company that has you know, just been contracted has a, a very positive reputation, a great, um, how would I say, portfolio. And also, this is, this is again, one of the positives with, with working with a very progressive uh, group of people. So this is a win-win. This is nice. I wish you would have started sooner. But all that matters is it's going in the right direction. And it's just, how would I say, changing the perception of um, the opportunities we have for uh, downtown Brockton. So, I wish so you awesome. would have started sooner, too. <laughs> <laughs> I know you're very modest, but I think people would be surprised by the surplus that you're able to generate even after all operating expenses. It's a matter of public record. So would you, would you share that, the approximate balance that you have now? Uh... Now you put me on the spot. Um, well, we have reserve funds, right? Is, and then we have uh, capital funds, right? The capital funds come from uh, money from enforcement uh, that the, that the uh, uh, council gives us every year. I believe the balance in our revolving fund right now is uh, so somewhere around 600000 and the, uh, the balance in the reserve funds after having our budget um, deducted for this year uh, is around the same, about $600,000, but 700000 was just deducted right, to pay for our, our operating expenses for the year. Okay, and the last thing from me is go out a little bit from July 2018. What, what are we looking at for anticipated completion of the project? Is it a year? Is it? It's 18 months. It's 18, 18 months. months. I, I figured, to, figured to open before January 1st of 20, or hopefully, hopefully before that. And, and now the garage may be open before the road work is done too, but 18 months uh, from groundbreaking to completion. <coughs> uh, and of course, this will all be open, uh, subject to open bid. Yeah. Just two more things. So. Um, in anticipation of the winters and uh, you know, the way that the city parking is open now for folks to park if we're going to have a particularly bad winter to keep them off the street, will this one also participate in that? Uh, because it's, it's a little different with the high tech kind of. Yeah. Um, geez, I hadn't even thought of that. Oh, I did because that's when I was I, I hadn't even thought of that because uh, we do have the Montello parking lot. We do have uh, the on the ones that we're using, there's six all together, the three that are under our control, South Street uh, for uh, residents in Camp Hollow, uh, the um, uh, Montello lot, right, and then the garage downtown the, uh, on uh, Crescent Street. Um, but I hadn't really thought about winter of 2020 <laughs> at this point. <laughs> yeah, as far as we're going to put cuts, I'm a little more. Uh, uh, worried right now about where I'm going to put the people who are parking there during construction. Right. <laughs> right. Right. Because a relocation plan for all those people is going to be necessary. We have um, leased the D'Angelo's lot across the street, with, uh, which will hold 43 of them. And uh, since phase two is not being built now concurrent with the garage, right, there will be space left over that we won't have to relocate everybody. Right? But we'll be seeking places to put people. Uh, there. Oh, 
Okay. We'll, 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 we'll cross the bridge when we come to it, I guess. Okay. And another thing, uh, you and I have spoken several times about you know the apps and different kind of parking apps, and you know I'm a huge advocate of the Park Boston app and us looking into that. And, uh, you did mention that. So there's another one that I, I actually use frequently in Boston um, that I just found out about. Uh, it's called Spot Hero, and I guess uh, yeah, you heard about that? Yeah, yeah. well, this also participate in that. And what that is really, you can kind of um, pre-schedule your parking. So I can say, oh, I'm going to be in, on, in downtown Boston uh, Wednesday from 12 to 1, and I need parking. And then you, you put in the address, and it'll show you all the available parking areas, and then you just pay for it right online. And you kind of just do it with your phone. You don't, there's no exchange of money or anything. It's so convenient. Um, and so people who can say, you know, I'll be downtown Brockton for two hours, and they prepay, will we'll this- Right, well that works, that works great off street. <clears throat> yes, right. yes, mm -hmm. right. it's just for the garages. Like, right, for the garages, right. just for the garages. And yeah, we'll look into something like that. But um, as far as the on street where the meters are going, right, <clears throat> um, we've already talked to um, a couple of different companies <laughs> called Pay by Phone. I like that. Right, so, uh, so that you can add time to your meter or pay by an app on your, on your phone, uh, right. rather than use a credit card or cash. But I didn't want to, they, they keep pushing to get this done, but I really didn't want to do it before we put the new meters in, right? There's no sense doing it, and then ripping the meters up and having to right. put all the decals back on or, you know, and go through the whole thing again, right? But that will be sure, right as, as soon as the meters go in, we'll be looking at that. And in the new garage, um, I'm anticipating a phone app also so that you don't have to walk to the kiosk to pay, right? If you have a monthly permit, that you can punch your number, open it up on a phone, punch your number in, tell them what space you're in, mm -hmm. right? And then the, the people who do enforcement would come by, grab a, a readout, right, of which spaces are, are paid for, right? And they'd be unable to write a ticket. It has to be integrated with the software that we use for um, enforcement, right? But they'd be unable to write a ticket in the space that's paid. This is just. I can't do that. This is I just. Can't park here. This is just an extra <laughs> option. Okay. <laughs> it's cash ready too. Yeah, you can use yeah. cash. Oh, okay. Yeah. 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 It won't take bills. It won't take bills. It'll take coins or credit cards yeah. or. Okay. Phone. Is the parking garage going to have charging stations and have any thoughts to bring an energy source? Yeah, we'll look into that once the garage is built. Um, we have charging stations in the one that we have already. So right. I would, you know, as more and more electric cars come online, we're going to need charging stations. So yes, I anticipate that we will. Thank you. Anybody else? I know I was interested. Glad I brought you. <laughs> I'm joined by the Dean of the Council, Ward 3, Council Dennis here and Thanks Thank for being here tonight, Dennis. We're going to open it up. If you have a question, if you could please come forward again and use the microphone so everybody can hear you and it can be noted. Um, again, the whole gist of this, and we do thank Council Fowler. That was very informative. Thank you, Phil, and thank you, Bob, for being here tonight. Um, you know, if there's any questions, please, by all means, come forward. And oh, God, do I need that? Oh, why not? Uh, actually, this question, this question is for Bob Sullivan. My memory is really poor and I lost my piece of paper because I didn't put it in my phone. Can you please repeat the phone number that we call when we see carriages screwed around the city of Rockton? Jeez, I don't know. You got me. Um, it's actually, it's through the DPW. It's Patrick Sullivan. 
Um, it's, it's on the city website. I don't know the, the, the number at the top of my head. DPW. It's the DPW, but Patrick Sullivan uh, is in charge. He's gone up Oak Hill Way. Um, and, and again, if you call the DPW and ask for Pat, he, he's the point person dedicated to the, okay. the ordinance for the. Uh, I know you've said it a million times. Yeah, I, I lost I, my piece of paper. I'm sorry about <laughs> that. But, but Pat, Pat um, actually, I spoke to him recently. He gave me an update. And, um, believe it or not, a lot of the uh, supermarkets in the city of Brockton have hired one or two of these companies um, that go around the city. They get the fee from from the you know establishment. Oh, yeah. They have to go around and grab them. I saw one the other day. It's really? like one eight hundred pick up carriage or something oh. like that. So. <laughs> is it the recycling? It is. Yeah. Five eight zero seven eight six. It's on the city website. Bob. It looks like it's five zero eight. Yes. Five eight zero seven eight two seven. Seven eight two seven, and that's uh, the one down at Oak Hill Way. We cite the center down there. Any uh, any other questions? <laughs> so um, this has to do with um, the tapestry project, and. Um, the residents that are just absolutely, I'm going to say, devastated, apoplectic, raging, um, disappointed. Um, there isn't any word that comes with this project that has not um, been expressed um, by the residents. And um, there's continually questions that um, at least I've not heard answers to. Um, and I understand that, you know, maybe you're not going to answer and, and, and I'm not saying that you have to. Um, but I, I guess one of my questions for um, the folks that are able to vote, Bob, I know you're, you're conflicted um, and appreciate that. Um, and I don't think, Shannon, you were at the meeting. But um, so I guess that leaves Wynn and, and, and Moses. Um, I, I would like to know why it was that um, this council um, did not vote uh, on this matter um, prior to the election, but instead at the meeting just before the election on November 7th, chose to continue uh, the matter um, until after the election. And, you know, if you don't have to answer, no, no excuse was given, no reason, no, no excuse, I don't want to excuse. No reason was given, just other we want to continue. And I'm just wondering if anybody would like to give the answer as to why it was. Um, you know, keeping in mind that that had followed uh, a, a fairly contentious meeting um, uh, at, with residents present over at the Plough School, um, and then there was a hearing at the high school, um, and then uh, there was a, a, another meeting that was uh, scheduled after it was continued. But, it, it, it would either of the councillors be willing to uh, tell us uh, why it was that this matter was continued until after November seven? After November seven. I, I just want to say why. I just want to say why. The word conflicted people won't understand. Um, <laughs> why you're not seeing me involved in this matter? I'm an attorney, uh, and I actually have represented, represented the Sisters of Jesus Crucified for over the last nine or ten years. So. Uh, years ago, I went to the city clerk's office and I filed a disclosure saying if the sisters in any way come before the city of Mark and please be the city council, I'm out of it. So people have said to me, oh, you voted on it. I haven't voted on anything. I'm an attorney. I'm an officer of the court. I have accused myself at all times on this. But I will, I will say that there is a lot of confusion on what the council is doing. And I, and I know my colleagues can clarify what, it, what I mean by that. Thank you. My only question is why was it continued on... November 7th, excuse me, on the week before the election, such that it then um, went over until after the November 7th election. Well, let me answer what I know as to why it was continued. Uh, out of respect to the uh, working for city council who's been ill and was not present at the meeting, out of respect for him, we postponed it to a later date in hopes that he would be there when we were voting for that. That is at least the way I, I saw this. But let me just... Um, he made the motion to continue it. No, he didn't. No, he didn't. He wasn't, he wasn't present. Prior to the election, he wasn't present, and I thought. 
But I also want to I want to take a second to uh, address something that, in the, in the same line that Bob just did. Uh, as the community know, I work for the, uh, the Archdiocese of Boston. And I wanted to make sure that we are very clear as to where I stand with this. The project that we're voting on is the 40-year district. We're not voting on Project A, B, or C. We're not voting for one agency versus another. And the piece of property in question does not belong to the Archdiocese of Boston. It belongs to the sisters, and the sisters can do whatever they please with that piece of property. So the reason why I feel confident that I'm not in any way overstepping, conflicting, is that one, we're not voting on any project. We're voting on whether or not we go 40 yard in this area or we don't go 40 yard in this area. Two, the project in question, again, does not belong to where I work. And not once have I been told by my employer to satisfy the vote one way or the other. So I just wanted to make sure that that was clear here. And when the project becomes comes to fruition, then I, as a citizen of the city, will stand and defend it or oppose it, just like a regular citizen in front of planning, zoning, and some of the other entities. But I just want to make sure that that is clear. And I'll, I'll just offer what I remember. Uh, Ian had a meeting, I believe, at the Plough Academy. I think you were there in the world of people. As a result of that, the matter was coming back into the council. And my best memory is I referred it back to finance. I made a motion that because of all of the questions that were asked by all of the residents, now I needed clarification on some things. For one thing, it was alleged that that was an illegal district. You couldn't do it. Well, come to find out the state ruled on that in March and came out with a two-page analysis that it was legal. But because there was so much information, misinformation, I wasn't comfortable with having it go forward to a vote. So in my motion, it went back to finance. And I don't know what date that meeting was that we finally Well, that, it, I can help you out. That was, that was before the meeting I'm talking about, because it yeah. went back to finance, yeah. and then it came back to the city council for a vote. And it was at that meeting, and I mean, as God is my witness, I, I, I firmly believe that Paul students, he was there and made the motion. I could be mistaken, but I know Shana wasn't there because, in, as a matter of fact, I emailed you in and I asked you why, and you said, well, because, you know, Shana wasn't there and, and you felt, thought it was fair for people to vote. Now, that's what you said to me, and I, I'm yeah. going to just, you and, know. And I think Councilor Pluff was absent, too. I have mean, Councilor Monaghan. Monaghan, Monaghan, right. They but, were both absent. But Studensky was there. Okay, I, I, I mean, I'm not talking whatever, about you referring. Been, been your your I, memory I, could be and right. That's the one that was to be voted, and that's the one that ended up continuing it until after the election. So, whatever, I mean, I asked the question, what was the reason? I haven't heard it yet, but thank you. I have There's another question. Piece. There is one more piece, and, and forgive me, you know, correct me if I'm, if I'm wrong or remembering this incorrectly, because there were several meetings that I was not present for the travel, um, and that this has come up. So, if I remember correctly, and um, Councilor Cruz mentioned it or said something about it, our legislative council actually uh, did some research on one of those days that we were going to be voting on it, and there was something with like a 90 day expiration from. Um, the public hearing point to, to the time it was voted, and it went over that time, and then it ended up having to come back. If I remember correctly, that's what um, Shannon said, right? um, she said that, and she said that it had gone over so that it was not really illegal to be voting on it at that time, but it, we, we couldn't vote on it then because of that, that, um, that expiration of that 90 day public hearing, blah, blah. That was another meeting. So, okay, so this, okay, that's what I mean. That's what I remember. That's that it didn't well, that was on. that was the meeting. That was before the election. Though, no, too. it was after the election. It was after the election when Councilor Cruz said that he had to continue it because, by ironically, by the council continuing this matter until after November seventh, it had to go back to full public hearing 
for both bodies, which is when the people were allowed to come forward and be heard on this matter. That's the meeting that you're talking about. That was on November 14th. That was the that was after the election. Okay. So I'm I, sure I, that I, was, that was again, one of the I, I, you know, you don't want to give an answer. I, you don't have to. Nobody gave an answer that night. They just said, you know, we're continuing it. That's fine. I, I just my my other question is is that I, I, I just have to ask if if any of you are, are are at all willing to consider the fact that every single resident has spoken against this 40R overlay, and we're not talking the project. This is the changing of the ordinance. The people don't want that land changed from single family residential homes to 40R. And, and, and that is something that they bought their homes believing that that was gonna happen. And the fact of the matter is, is, is that if the council can ignore the will of every single voter, including all the people that spoke at that meeting, that have called, that have tried to advocate on their own behalf, to ask to be heard and considered and respected in the fact that they do not want this there. Put it somewhere else. Find a solution that works where you don't trample on the rights of the people who bought those houses believing that they were buying in a serene, rather rural, single family residential zone because this is the thing if you can do it to those people over on thatcher street then obviously you have the will and the way to do it to every single voter and every sing in every single ward in this city and I, I i just really have to say you know it is unfathomable to me to sit there at a meeting and to watch all of these people coming out these are not people who ever come to meetings or anything else. These are people that are coming out because their lives are to being disrupted. They are passionate enough to make trips to the city hall not once but twice in one week when they, I'm sure, had far better things to do. And every one of them stood and said, we're against it. Nobody indicated they were in favor of it. And at the, the city council meeting, at the ordinance meeting, twice, anybody in, fav in favor? Silence. Second time, anybody in favor? Silence. Even the representative, well, let, 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 me let, finish, me, let me finish. Even the representative that was there that night didn't even have the nerve to stand up and say, he was in favor of it. Nobody stood in favor of it. Nobody answered in favor of it. And, and, and I just have to say, I'm asking you to the record, just- can you clarify the word representative? Who are you talking about? Attorney Burke, Attorney Burke. He, he wasn't invited to the meeting. But he could have spoke. He was sitting there. He was in the room. He was sitting on the stairs with Rob May he, right he, behind me. Anybody in right, favor? Well, now, now let me finish. We don't, right, we don't. No, 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 let me finish. No. No, I, you you haven't started finish. yet. You haven't started yet, sir. I'm going to finish. Then you can start. All right? So, <clears throat> even he wouldn't stand up and answer, is anybody in favor of this project? So you have an entire group of people that are uh, against this. Nobody is for it. And yet, despite that, you are digging your heels in, and obviously, because of the fact that for some reason, for some reason, you people decided you want to have this project on that property and you don't care whether or not the <coughs> residents want it or not. It's your decision and that's how you want it. I have to say that that is absolutely not democracy, not being a true representative of the people that voted you in. And, and, and I just, you know, if you want to say, oh, that's not true, I don't care. This has been a back, back room bad job deal since the very get-go. And the fact that now people have spoken out of, against, it, against it and you all turn blind eyes, I have to say, what is wrong with your sight? Have you finished? Yes. Now it's my turn. Okay. You have engaged in some of the most, shall we say, inappropriate behavior calling counselors dumb as dirt 
You have accused people of taking money for their vote, which I find reprehensible for someone who used to be a prosecutor. You've called people trash because they happen to have a particular position on an issue. I came to the council and I ran for councilor at large. I can't focus on just 60 or 100 people in Ward 4. I have to focus on the entire community. And I have residents who want increased police services. They want increased fire services. They want middle school sports programs. They want lower class sizes. They want roads reconstructed. If I adopted your position, any 60 or 100 people could simply come into the council and say, I don't want that to take place, even though it does financially benefit the city. I will throw you out of office, you're trash, you're dirt, you don't belong in the council. I reject that. I suggest to you that every city councilor, whether it's 30 years ago, this year, or 30 years in the future, has to look at the big picture. Is it beneficial for Brockton? Will it upset a few people if that project goes through? And I say if because, ironically, 93 Center Street, which was going to be a housing development, that's fallen through. That's not going to happen, from what I understand. I think the BRA is taking over the property, from what I was told. Now, Gary's shaking his head. But the point I'm trying to make is there isn't anyone in this room that knows if a project is going to go down there, should the zoning pass, or isn't a project going to get out there. There are a whole host of issues, environmental, financing, whatever you want to say. I happen to look at traffic studies that were done on Thatcher Street today. Granted, they're 10 years old. They should be updated. 417 cars is the peak traffic volume in the morning. And it's a little more in the afternoon, but I suggest that's because people are coming home and heading into East Bridgewater. I have put a considerable amount of time into this whole issue of zoning. Not because it's a bag job, not because I don't even belong to any order or to the Catholic Church. I'm one of those pesky Episcopalians, you know, the Anglican side of things. And I made a determination that if a project goes there, in a city that's dying financially, in a city where I have 100,000 people, not just 100 to worry about, in a city where I do have to make sure we have the finances available to provide critical services, that if the zoning change went through, there might be an opportunity for a project to come in and yield some benefits. There have been all kinds of outrageous comments about, well, you know, if 50 kids come from that project, we lose money. No one mentions the fact that we've already lost more than that to the charter school. If we had 50 kids come in, we get about 14 grand per kid in state aid to education reimbursement, and that would help offset the loss in revenue. No one mentions the fact that if people had some vehicles down there, we would have excise tax revenue. No one mentioned the fact that the housing primarily, and I believe you were at the Little Theater when the people from the Planning Office of Urban Affairs made a presentation, they're not looking for a low income. I've heard, well, we're going to bring in drug dealers and low income. They're trying to provide workforce housing for people who make, if my memory serves, between 16 grand and about 99 grand a year. They even mention the different clerical or administrative positions in the city where someone might work for the city and make $40,000, $45,000 a year and want to live in an apartment down there and contribute to the city and maybe even take a course at Massasoit, become contributing members of society. Not everyone can afford to buy a house. That's the other argument that I've heard. Well, we've got all these houses for sale in Brockton. People have to establish credit. People have to have sufficient income. People have to pass the financing guidelines. So unfortunately, apartments are needed. We have a high demand for apartments in this city. There is a waiting list for the BHA, which by the way, I suppose could be called affordable housing, that if you put your name on there now, you're lucky if you got an apartment in two years. So if you strip away all of the misinformation and you reject all of the absolutely infantile, inappropriate comments that are made simply because someone disagrees with the position a counselor takes, I think the council has conducted itself properly. We've held the public meetings. We've followed 40A. 
We realized that one of our colleagues was sick and we had to postpone a couple of meetings. We also, as I just reminded uh, Councillor Sullivan, we didn't meet the day before election because traditionally you don't. If we had met the day before election, I suspect this would have been voted on. There was nothing nefarious about that. I'm certainly not timid to take a position on an issue and listen to you and others and all of the diatribe that comes out. Have at it. But I can tell you right now, I'm comfortable with what I've heard. I'm comfortable that this is a zoning change. I'm comfortable that if there is any project that might come to fruition down there, it will go through a regulatory review. It will go through guidelines that are established. There is an opportunity, because I asked this question at the Little Theater, to downsize the project. If 175 apartments is too much, maybe 100 would be acceptable to the neighbors, especially when they see that it's going to be broken up into separate buildings. So I guess I'm kind of at the point where we have belabored this point and belabored this point. We've held public hearings. We've put up with the misinformation. We've put up with the accusations that it's a bad job, which is absolutely ridiculous. We're talking about a zoning change. And I don't know what else to tell you. I, now, you're not going to be satisfied. I, and by the way, I know you, excuse me, live a far, probably as far away from that project as you could. So I don't know if you're representing people as an attorney in this, or whether this is an avocation of yours that you don't like affordable housing. That's, that's on you. All wrong. Both wrong. Well, Both what, wrong. whatever it is, let me just say, I would hope, however this turns out, that we remain professional. Uh, I can't speak for everyone who uses social media. If they wish to use it as anti-social media, that's up to them. But as far as I'm concerned, I'll let Councilor Rodriguez speak for himself. I looked at this strictly from the standpoint of what do I do for 100,000 people in this city given the financial constraints that we face every year, and what impact will this have on the city, the zoning change, and do we have safeguards in place where if a project comes in, we can tailor that project as much as possible to what the residents would like and what would be beneficial to the city. That's all I'm going to say. The vote will come up whenever it does, and I certainly respect the residents who spoke against it, but as an analogy, I would guess, I'll close by saying this, I would guess that when Westgate Mall was proposed and all of the traffic it brings to Oak Street and the police calls because of shoplifting, I'll bet there were more than 60 or 100 residents that were opposed to Westgate Mall, but the city didn't turn its back on it. Someone looked at that project and said, you know what, we think it will be beneficial. We think it will bring in revenue. And they approved it, and it became a reality. You can't have 60 or 100 people veto something that has the potential for benefiting 100,000. And you can't do it, certainly, when you're threatened. Threatened that you're going to be thrown out of office if you vote a certain way. When you, and I'm an old street cop, so I never like a gun pointed at my head saying, if you go this way, I'm going to pull the trigger. You want to have meaningful dialogue? That's one thing. You want to engage in those type of scurrilous activities? Forget it, you've lost me. You've turned me off, and whatever credibility people have to engage in that kind of behavior, as far as I'm concerned, there is no credibility. Well, sir, now you just said that there is no project, and yet you're talking about the project that they were presenting. So I, I, this is the misinformation. You keep on saying there's misinformation. I said potential. It's mi but you mentioned the, what the people said, what, what, what they presented with the number of units. Yep. And you also keep on saying that they can cut it down. But that, again, is misinformation. If you read the law and understand the law of 40R, you can't cut it down if, in fact, you have already made it a provision that that's what they can have. Because if you try to do that, then they can come forward and say that you are being unreasonable and they will be successful. So the problem is, is that in the way that this ordinance is written, that it is problematic. And I have, I, I guess my, my other question is, why is it that, and I understand that many of the counselors were not going to care about the voters and what they said or what the residents said. The minds were made up before the residents learned about this and before they had a voice. But, but the fact of the matter is I have submitted to the council numerous amendments that would be more protective of the community. 
Amendments such as limiting the amount of units to 20% of the affordable housing and don't allow, and make that a maximum. So that is all your minimum floor, it's also your maximum floor. And then the rest would be market rate. I also submitted um, a, re, suggested amendments as it relates to other language that would protect um, and help the city in regards to funding. Having something in there that if there is a project there that the individuals will pay certain things, will give the city certain things. This is what happened in Easton. Easton had a, a 40R issue and they were, they were smart. They were smart selectmen, smart counselors. They negotiated in advance of approving the 40R project so that the city would get all of these extra benefits before they allowed the ordinance to go through. So again, I don't understand, and maybe you can explain to me why none of the suggested reasonable amendments that don't call for the complete voting down of this, but actually would provide for safety nets that would withstand judicial scrutiny, okay? Why none of those amendments have been talked about by any of the counselors in a public meeting, because I've been to them all. None of those amendments have been put in. The, I asked uh, Mr. Zioli, the ordinance that is before you is the same ordinance that went before the other ordinance committee. So why is it that, you know, I understand, counselor, that you have been for this from the get-go. You didn't really care what I the resident said. I well, I have the don't, emails don't to say that. Well, that. I have the email saying you were for it back in October of 2016. So that's when it first came in, into us. In any yes. event, in any event, why is it that no amendments that would benefit Councilor Rodriguez? I gave him a whole list of, of, of amendments to the ordinance, not the the strike down of the whole thing, not scorch the earth, but amendments that would allow for some additional protections for those individuals that live in that neighborhood that are getting dumped on. Because this is the thing, we're not talking about the project, we're talking about 40R. You make that 40R and it's going to be 40R and they're gonna be stuck with 40R. It doesn't matter who comes in. It could be a great company that comes in, it could be a terrible company and it's not gonna really matter for the residents because we're not talking projects. So whatever was presented by those people from Boston at that finance committee meeting, quite frankly, shouldn't even be discussed. You brought it up, so I just ask you not to consider what they provided because the fact of the matter is, is that that's not relevant to the ordinance. So, looking at the ordinance, why is it that none of the proposed suggested amendments that I have put forth to you all since at least September have been considered and put into that ordinance that would make the amendments that somehow or another could help the residents to feel a little bit better about what was gonna happen and also would withstand judicial scrutiny. Even Mr. May at that meeting, at the finance committee meeting said, yeah, there's things that you could do. You could make a limit and say they have to give 70% of the houses to Rockton residents. And I even said, why don't you put in part of the amendment that the housing has to go to Brockton residents who've lived in Brockton for at least a period of, you know, the prior three years. All of these amendments have been suggested and proposed and none of them have been put into that ordinance. The ordinance has to stay as written according to Clerk Zioli since the very beginning. So why, understanding that you, you believe this is right, why are you unwilling to even consider making amendments to this ordinance that would at least address some of the concerns that the, that the residents are concerned about? Um, and, and again, a simple one. Take out the part where there's uh, no, no uh, limit on the number of units and set a maximum. Make it 20% or 25% if there's a person 55 or over in there, and it's a, it's a threshold minimum, 25%, but no higher than 25%. I, I don't understand why the council has not been willing to even consider those reasoned amendments that didn't call for you to go against what you believe to be the right thing. So again, I, I, I just have to say, if you're going to go forward with this, please 
put in some amendments that can be held up in a court of law. Put in that if in fact this is this 40 r is approved and a project does go forward, that anybody who builds that project knows the following things. If you're going to build that project, 70% of the units must shall, use the word shall because it's very important in the law, shall go to residents that are already residents of the city of Broughton and have been for at least three years. That way people know that someone who's going to live there is my neighbor, is, my, is somebody who has the same struggles that I have. So that's just one of the many amendments that I submitted. I've submitted them to you all. I understand that some of the councilors didn't get their packets um, and whatnot or didn't have an opportunity to read them. But I would just ask you um, tonight, that, you know, go back and read those. And if you're going to go forward with this ordinance, please consider making those reasoned amendments. That's why I struggle with and why I say bad job, because those are things that could be done. I have put forth to the council, and I have been putting forth to the council since at least September of this year, and not one amendment has been made to this ordinance. Thank you. So basically, my name is Kim Williams. I'm a resident of Ward 6. I just basically, I was going to ask, um, if it becomes a 40R, can the amendments be made? And how long would it take back to, so if the project didn't go through as a 40R, or whatever that is, um, how long would it take to go back to potentially to go through the council? Is it the same kind of process? Um, like if you get that far and the project doesn't, doesn't go through, what happens to the land, et cetera? Can someone else come in and bid on it just as a 40R with no amendments? Or are you allowed to change it after it's approved? Go ahead, I'm looking up something and then I'll answer that. I, I can answer that. Uh, I think one thing we'll forget is that we do have some opportunities. And I do, uh, I do agree with you, uh, uh, Jean, uh, to, a, to a point, that conditions need to be put in. You know, I've said this all along, that we have an opportunity here for something decent in that area. But no is not the answer either, because as Council Farwell was stating, we're in a city that needs resources. That's why I gave the amendments to you, Moses. Yeah, but, but you gotta understand one thing. You gotta understand one thing, and I gotta go back to what uh, Council Farwell was saying. You gave me an amendment. We went to a meeting at the, at the little theater, and the person who was actually making, I think Rob May was talking, and he basically said, that is gonna be the issue. With the 70, with, with the 20%, uh, 20, uh, 80% or 70%, whatever percentage that he, that he brought up. And the important thing that we got to keep in mind is that do you have any idea how many suggestions or numbers of amendments people that actually email on a regular basis or send it to us on a regular basis that we must put in because Joe doesn't like this, Peter doesn't like that. All these things take time to negotiate and come up with the right plan in the right place. To be honest with you, there's a process in place. The, the, a project cannot just, just because it's a 40-yard redistricting, it doesn't mean that they bypass every single licensing process that they have to go through. That still exists. Just because an area is designated as a 40-yard, it doesn't mean that you can get up and build whatever you want to build in it without any sort of giving the residents an opportunity to say something or give elected officials an opportunity to say something. So just because we're voting on the redistricting, it doesn't mean we're voting on the project. And when the, the time comes for the project, we can put all kinds of conditions that we want to put in. Because to be honest with you, I live about a half a mile away from that project. I have my own things that I want to see being done in that area. It might not be what you do because you don't live in that area. I do. I want to see. I, want, I as a resident of the city, want to see certain things be done as well. It doesn't. It doesn't mean that you and I agree with what your demands are. I have my own demands. I have neighbors in that area. They want certain things done as well too. You know. I have individuals in the city who are dying for decent housing as well. That I have to look at and say, you know what. There's supposedly a project coming out of the pipeline that might benefit you. 
I mean, it really bothers you know, you know me the fact that I hear how concerned we are for children, how we want to provide housing, we want to do this. And anytime there's a project that might better the life of one person in the city, we have, guess what, people coming out of woodwork saying, man, that's not good, it's not this, it's not that. We have the superintendent of schools writing letters saying that she opposes the project because it might increase children to the public school system. It might increase children. You are an educator, people want to provide children with a place to call home. You know, we were told that 70% of those homes would be set aside for Rockford residents if that project comes to fruition. We were told that. You were there. But you can't, you can't, you can't make, you can't enforce that. Rod May's statement at a finance committee meeting is not enforceable. But when you go to the licensing of no, the project. that's what I'm saying though. No, under 40R, that's not the case. You can't require it with, after the fact. You've got to put it in this ordinance under 40R. No, you can, you, when somebody goes into planning or no. zoning, you can do that. Rod, you cannot, Moses, this is why. This is why I feel so strongly it needs to be done now. Even Rob said, Rob May said it should be done now. The fact of the that's matter. Not, that's not what I, I don't recall him saying that, but if, if, the if fact, you're saying that. The, the fact of the matter is that when, when a, a developer, whoever they may be, goes before the planning board, if they meet all the criteria in the ordinance that you all have created, the planning board's hands are tied. They cannot withhold that approval without facing the consequence of the developer saying that they are putting unreasonable restrictions. That's why the ordinance needs to be written tightly with everything you want now. You, there's some things that they can hold back on, but, but things like requiring that amount of, of, of um, uh, apartments to go to people that live here in Brockton, that's not when it can happen. They don't have to do it. The, no developer has to agree to that. Now, I, I understand that it, Rob May said it, but just because he said it, that's why I'm saying, if people are making promises about what will be done, then it should be included in this ordinance that whoever is the developer whoever that developer is, because we don't know who the developer is going to be. So whoever the developer is commits to this. And that's what I'm telling you Easton did. Before they approved the 40R, before they did any of this, they got the approval and they conditioned the 40R upon whoever the developer was must do these things. As far as the amount of units, again, you can't change the amount of units. If, in fact, the ordinance says that there is no maximum as to the number of units, then that means the developer is free to make the entire project, every single unit, to be affordable housing under that ordinance. So all I'm saying is, is that I understand you may get a lot of emails about it, but this is, this is specific items that I have given you that I, I strongly urge you, I mean, talk with your legis legislative counsel. That's why you have legislative counsel. And if, 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 if she says I'm wrong, well, then you listen to your legislative counsel because I'm not your counsel. I'm not the attorney here. All I am is a resident here saying, I understand I've read the statute. I've read what it says in the statute. And I understand that there are very few things once the ordinance and the overlay is approved that you all can force a developer to do without now if they're willing to do it okay but it's a matter of if they're not willing to do it then what are you going to do how are you going to enforce that provision that you thought that you had and the city has continually gotten caught up in this i mean i read an article back when you all first did the first 40r overlay and you said you were gonna do the 40R overlay in downtown Brockton, but it barely passed because there was a lot of concerns about it because it really wasn't, it was questionable whether it really was all that beneficial for the city. And I don't know as though it seemed that it has been quite frankly in any event. But the fact of the matter is, is that we said that it was, it, it was said that the 40R was gonna be looked at cautiously. But again, that's more in terms of the global thing. The, 
the fact of the matter is, is that if you want to best protect yourself, you put the information in now. I don't understand what the harm is in putting that information in now. If your passion is to make sure that 70% goes to Brockton residents that have been here for three years, then put it into the ordinance. That that's one of the requirements that the developer, that way when the developer applies, whoever they are, maybe the six developers apply, they know going in, this is what it is that I'm stuck with, okay? Because otherwise, if they go to planning, you try to stick that in after the fact. If they're not willing parties, they don't have to do it. And well, let me ask you a question before Bob even answers. So. Okay, so we do those, let's say, two or three amendments today to the order. What happens to the opposition? I don't know. Maybe they consider the fact that. No, I'm saying from your thing. I, I would, I, I would look at it and say, well, at least the counselors are are are, are giving some consideration and trying to make it more palatable than 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 it is. And 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 so it, I think it shows good, you know, um, goodwill. Um, if you, if you if you'll have it to, to make just one 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 two three amendments that could make a world of difference right, in regards so let me, to this let project. Let me put it to you this way before so. you Bob answers again. I promise you that when we go to the council meeting, I'll introduce two of those amendments. How's that? The the seventy. Well, what I'm. What you're favorite. The the two that I just said, in terms of the seventy, making sure the seventy percent of the apartments. If it gets to apartments, because we don't know that yet, if it gets to the apartments, that 70% will be set aside for Brockton residents. I, I asked Mr. May that, the state will not allow it. Soon De Castro asked me to do that, so I asked Rob May if he would research. The state will not allow you to set a percentage like that. You can put in there to the maximum extent possible, but you can't, but you can't pick we will, percentage. I'm telling you, we will research what we have to do in terms of that, because that's a concern of mine. I want to make sure that the residents of this city that are looking for housing have an opportunity to get decent housing first. So if we can do it, we'll do that. I, uh, I also want to recognize the council a lot. The council, I'm not even that large yet, maybe. Uh, Ward 7 sure leads that from Jonas. Thanks. Uh, I, I just want to, we got to address that, the question you asked. Um, but one thing, first of all, is, is if you if you roll back time, I was the council that brought 40R forward to downtown Brockton. And I take exception because uh, you're saying you don't think it could benefit it. The gentleman that was just here, talking about parking garage, Trinity Five Financial, they wouldn't have come to Brockton, $30 million investment without 40R smart growth zone. Then said days wouldn't have taken over the old style market if it wasn't within a 40R zone. So that's a fact, Councillor, and that's, it was beneficial. And let's just talk about the history of the city of Brockton. Um, Thatcher Street just had an overlay district last year, just approved last year by the council. Everett's Auto Body, it's an overlay district. Overlay district in Ward 3 with the Dean, medical marijuana. That was a hot issue, wasn't it, Councillor? Councillor Dubois almost put the council over. But you know what? You don't get any complaints over that now, because we did our due diligence. Now, at the end of the day, you can't, you can't get everybody to agree on an issue, but we're charged to, to vet out ordinances of the city of Brockton. We're also charged to see that zoning is beneficial to the city of Brockton. So we need to get back to the people that, that live in the ward. Um, but I do know one person who lives in the ward because it was stated tonight that nobody supports this. Paul Stadinsky, who served 12 years on the city council, is retiring. He supports this. And so I, I think that's one and person I, that does support it. And I do. And you do. It's adopted under the uh, national law. Well, they just debated back and forth, so I'm not sure what the answer is. <laughs> so if you don't know, that's fine. Okay, <laughs> but I, I was trying to look up the minutes of the meeting, and uh, forgive me, refresh my memory as to the question. It was just if it's zoned as a 40R, what are the ch if it doesn't go through as apartments, whatever the deals are, how long does it take to go back to a different type of zoning, or what are our options? For the city to go forward. If, if it if it's if 40R is adopted, it has to be approved by the state. My understanding is, I believe you have to wait three years before you can change back to a different zoning path. So if this project money. doesn't go through, potentially it could go out to any other person looking for a 40R property or 40R um, project. Yes, that is, that is correct. And my earlier statement about downsizing the project. This occurred at the Little Theater at Brockton High School, and I think there were three people from the Planning Office of Urban Affairs. 
and I put them on the spot, and I said, look, if the residents don't want that amount of housing, are you willing to negotiate a lower number? And they said they were. Now, we can all sit around and say they have no integrity, they're lying, when they, they pulled the wool over your eyes. I mean, I can only ask the questions, get them on camera, get them to admit that's what they said they would do, and then hopefully they have credibility. You know, I, I can vouch for me, I can't vouch for anyone else as far as whether they'll follow through with what they say they're going to do. But when you know they have no credibility, I gave you the case and I gave you the application where in November of 2016, they applied for and received a benefit from a charitable organization based upon their representations. And in November of 2016, they indicated in that application two very important things that were absolutely false. One is that the city had already approved 40R, which clearly it hadn't because we are talking about it tonight. And two, that the project for the uh, property there was already underway. And, and that, I'm gonna say, I'm gonna hope is a lie because you're saying that there is no project. And so. They made a mistake. You know, I, well. Based on your complaint, I followed up with the gentleman at the planning office of urban affairs and I put him on the spot. And I said, why did you write that into that document? when you know we have not approved it. <clears throat> Pardon me. And he came back and he said that, you're right. He said that is an error. The date is an error. And so, when, when I asked him about it outside the little theater, right after they got done telling you all, you folks inside the room. You they, asked to talk with them. I asked him that question. I said, why did you lie? And they refused to answer. So I, I, I have to say, you know, and I also gave you the case from 1998 that was very, very clear that they engage in just engaged in deceitful behavior, lying and misrepresenting. At the time they said it was a mistake then too. So it seems like they make a lot of mistakes that end up with misrepresentations. And I just, you know, I mean, they're not a project. You, you keep on referring to them, but, but you're telling us that they're not a project. So I, I a potential project. And I would say to you, 18 years ago in 1998, I can't vouch for what they did. The other thing I can tell you is the good Lord didn't put me on this earth to pass judgment on who makes a mistake and what penalty should inure to that person, nor should they be forever never believed in the future when it, whenever they take an act. That's just not my job here on this earth. You, since you raised the question about why some of us didn't pay attention to your suggested amendments, if I'm not mistaken, did you not go to a meeting involving uh, the planning board and make a statement about the people at 50 Center Street, they're not worldly enough, they really don't care about the center of the city, and they don't spend any money down there, because that's in the minutes of a meeting. That's what I just spent five minutes trying to, to, uh, to find. And it so offended the secretary to the planning board because her son, who was a teacher at the time, up at Brockton High School asked to address you and say, wait a minute, my son lives there. He cares about the city. He is worldly enough. Does that refresh your memory? No. It doesn't? Okay. Well. No, because I, it, I was at that meeting and I made a statement and it related to the fact that those people didn't even show up at a city council meeting that was held in their own building. That was what the comment was about. Now, the woman who prepared those minutes is the woman who took exception to me. So. Most respectfully, you could, correct it. Uh, you could go to a meeting and have it corrected and, and, and protest. Uh, well, I'm correcting it now. You raise it, and I'm correcting. Well, I can't correct planning board. Well, you have every right to I was unaware she wrote something I didn't say, and I will address her with it in the appropriate fashion. I raised the issue of the fact that I said because they were talking about the people of of that. Uh, uh, about downtown Broughton and everyone being concerned and caring about it and I said really because when there was a ward council meeting in their very building and they were walking back and forth and seeing us sitting in there not a one of them came in that was what actually I said now I understand that what was put in there was a little different um, and the person creating those minutes obviously was Again, upset. I can't me. pass judgment on all those but, people who didn't go to a meeting. I can't, but the can't. fact if of the, you can, that's fine. the fact of the matter is is that I gave you the case. I, I drove to your house to give you a copy of that case. 
that talked about their deceitful behavior. Okay. So, please. Okay, I'm gonna interject here. Um, as you can see, we kind of thin the herd up here. <laughs> uh, so, and, you know, I, I don't wanna all this stuff. Excuse me, I'll step my balance, but as, you know, as one of the four counselors, I think it would be appropriate to either ask if anyone else has any more questions, um, and if not, I think we would be a good time to adjourn. Um, and we'll spend the remainder of the time Representing businesses here, and Wynn brought it up, that uh, it was um, uh, the perception was that 93 Center Street was a um, defunct field. Um, the only defunct out of it was one partner yeah. had vacated, and he was the uh, planner that was also planning, and he got 25% of the deal. Um, he resigned from the project uh, because he was charging the owner of the building $7,000 a month for his work that he was doing on the planning part of it, which nothing had happened. Um, phase one environmental hadn't happened, phase two hadn't happened, none of this had happened. But that doesn't mean that the owner had dropped the ball. Um, he's actually gone and hired a new consultant. He's hired Greystone Development out of New York, uh, which is a very reputable company. Um, uh, phase one and phase two of the environmental, which I control, uh, we uh, which are a 5,000 uh, UST underground storage tank from under the ground, had the soil tested, uh, had the uh, air tested, uh, all that has been completed. Um, right now we have a feasibility study going. The owner of the property is into it for over $400,000 is his own money. He has a loan out for another $400,000 with uh, half of one, and we've accumulated $3.5 million in tax credits. And to get a letter the other day from the um, Brockton Redevelopment Authority that they were going to take uh, the property by eminent domain uh, out of um, 
I believe it was voted on in May of 2016 under the urban renewal plan um, that they have the right to do this. But I thought that plan was uh, basically to take vacant properties or properties that weren't being utilized. But we have over $900,000 in architectural design also uh, that's um, going to be uh, a lien on this property. Um, I don't feel that uh, the city council knows this, so I felt that I should come here tonight and just let you know that he is going strong. They did give us a deadline to Friday uh, the 22nd, which would be next Friday, uh, a week from tomorrow, uh, to respond. Uh, otherwise, they were just going to take it, uh, take the property from the owner. Uh, I have called William Galvin's office to find out um, how they can take a historic building that's under the National Historic Register uh, by eminent domain. Uh, and they told me that it was a possibility that it could not be done. But I just want to bring it to your attention that this does not project a business-friendly city when you are threatened with eminent domain after you've owned a building for 25 years. Um, he's done business in Brockton for 35 years. He was first up on North Main Street and then bought this the old United Furniture Building, putting his own furniture store in there. Every floor in that building is filled up with furniture, just so you do know. He does have four tenants in there. Um, the tenants uh, really love it there. They don't want to relocate. Um, the furniture store himself, he is 70 years old, but he has three children that he would like to leave the business to. They don't want to really relocate. Um, there is going to be 2,500 square feet of commercial space on the first floor, and we have a potential tenant for that in 2020. Um, so I just needed to know that this project is going forward, and we're not stopping because we're being threatened by anybody, but I just felt that the councilors should know exactly what was going on with it and keep you up to speed. So and by the way, it wasn't Westgate Mall, it was Westgate Gardens to start with. Well, that's true. <laughs> so it's Ted Carmen and Concord Square Development that's out, and there's a new that entity correct. that's come in. That is Because we had the press conference with Yes. With uh, Concord Square. He was invited over to the Brockton 21st Century Corp to sit with Mike Gallarani, and when he went over there, he came back very distraught because he was nothing but insulted when he went there by being told he has done nothing with the building, he never is going to do anything, um, uh, something that he should go back to Egypt and maybe do business there. Now that's not something professional to say to anybody, uh, no. especially a man who's done business in Brockton for 35 years. So I just think you need to know this. Thank, thank you, you. Thank, uh, you thank you very much. Glenn. And uh, oh, Mr. Hogan. Yeah. Um, just real quick. Um, I wanted to go on record, uh, not that anybody really cares, I don't have any position Authority, but I'm against more housing in Brock and this cluster housing, I should say. I'm for single family, single family homes. I have a little bit of a cold, my voice uh, dying out on me. Um, but the, uh, you're not going to have an answer, but I'm going to ask you. The BRA, I found out that some good friends of the area, everybody knows that. I found out about this a couple of days ago. I was quite upset about it. It has nothing to do with me personally, but I was quite upset. Um, what it does to me, it's like the elephant in the room. All of a sudden, I, I know this, but maybe other people will see it. The planning in Brockton, their planning is to dump housing in, in, in downtown Brockton. That's, that's the idea. And I'm not against all housing, but every project that comes along is housing. Uh, other venues that we need to come this way towards Brockton, uh, downtown Brockton, like the police station, all I hear is rumors, it's rumors, that they want to move it further away from downtown Brockton. So I'm saying that the planning, whoever, in Brockton, is housing in downtown, moving the proper venues out of downtown. Um, so just all that said, no, no details or anything like that. And I know you don't know the answer, but what the BRA wants to take this, this uh, private business by eminent domain, what do they want to put there? If it's housing, it's the elephant in the room. Well, See? You, you brought up a very good point. And, and January or February, we're going to have the executive director of the redevelopment authority and the planning director come in because we need an update on the downtown urban renewal plan. Sure. That plan <coughs> published a series of buildings that were going to be taken by eminent domain. Yes. I just by chance happened to ask the gentleman who owns Dunkin' Donuts at the foot of the police station at Center on Montello. By the way, did you know your building was on a list to be taken by eminent domain? And he, he was horrified. He said, I've, I've owned this for 36 years. 
The interesting thing is that when you take it by eminent domain, you have to pay fair market value and you have to pay relocation expenses to move that business to another location. So before this downtown urban renewal plan gets too far afield, I, I think we have to bring it back in. Hopefully uh, you'll I, I be there. Be, and I, I will be. Let, let's I find out where we are because. Yeah. I, I actually knew that because I went to the meeting maybe two years ago and started up. And I see it as a, um, a deduction of a business, whether you like Dunkin' Donuts. We know we have problems down there, but it's still a business that's been there for a long time. If you take it by m and for me, yeah. and you put parking there for the, I know what they want to call it. Well, then you're minus a business. Hey, you put people out of work. You put people out of That's work. That's not right. Yes. And I know you didn't have the answer, um, but I, I wanted to bring it up as Gary. I'm, I've been sitting here trying to say something. I want to input. Um, <laughs> anyway, and the, the Ward 5 people are correct. Um, I've asked to speak at a Ward 5 meeting. Um, simply for a reason, that, and you're aware of this because I've been working on a parkway that resonates from Salisbury Park, which is in Ward 5. Ironically, over the years, all these events that I've been putting on, the people that show up to help me at these events are not from Ward 5. <laughs> so I'm literally going to put myself on the spot at a Ward 5 meeting and say, you need to show up. Or you are going to get dumped on. You need to have a voice. I don't know where all that's going. <laughs> it's on. It's on video. I'm on record. But uh, let's hope this thing at Center Street. It's like the elephant that I think they they want to just dump. They, it's not. It doesn't take a genius to come up with parking and housing. But maybe a hotel in that building, right next to the commuter rail. See a little more. A little more thinking that stuff. Not not housing. Uh, the owner he owns the building. If he wants to put housing in the he wants to put his own money up, and I think that's that's fine with him. But if the BRA is going to take it by eminent domain and put housing in there, I could have thought of that in the eighth grade. You know, why are we paying these people to come up with a plan like that? Thank you, Mr. Logan. And I so, a lot of coffee today. so just a couple things. Um, again, Council of Bonners will not will not be serving next legislative session. We will be joined by uh, a new Council at Large, Gene uh, rather Darren Ford. But both Moses, Gwen, and myself, and, uh, and, and I guess we'll speak on Gene's behalf as well. We're going to continue this next year. We're going to do our quarterly meetings as well next year. Um, we do want to thank you all for coming in tonight. And in spirit of the Marks, it was a good conversation. Um, I would also urge you to pay attention to Monday night. Um, we have a finance committee meeting. I follow the resolve relative to the old district court on West Elm Street. Right now, there's an RFP on the street. Uh, Cullen County is attempting to sell that building. Uh, I think that the city of Barton would be uh, really selling itself short if it doesn't really look at that. I mean, it's a ton of land. Uh, it's a great building. It needs some cost updates, but it's right across the street from the Wall Memorial, which the city owns. So um, I invited Mayor Carpenter, uh, Rob May, and uh, Phil Nezzer the city solicitor to come before the Finance Committee by night to chat about that. Um, with that being said, again, I want to thank Councilor Fowler, Councilor Rodriguez, and Council Barnes for a great year. I wish you all happy holidays, Merry Christmas, happy and healthy 2018, and I'll share it with my colleagues. <laughs> you want to conclude it. <laughs> Time, times two. <laughs> yes, thank you everyone for coming too, and, and also I want to uh, recognize Council Sullivan uh, for initiating these meetings. They've been very helpful, and, and the feedback from the residents has been that uh, these are, are really helpful, and even if they aren't, aren't able to come, they're able to watch it. Uh, on, on TV or on the uh, YouTube channel that BCA has. So um, thank you for, for doing that and, and, and including all of us and encouraging folks to come and to come with their questions and their concerns because uh, this is how things get done. Uh, we do conversation, we do planning, um, we do execution. So this is definitely um, a good thing to have. And I'll, next time I come, I'll be on that side uh, with some things. But, um, you know, I, I definitely. Uh, Hopefully, you all keep it going. This is very, very beneficial. The residents love it. Thank you. Merry Christmas. Have a good evening.